go ahead and say hello to this episode of Esports Connected with the Esports Trade Association, Chris Johnson with Johnson S Insurance. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Megan. How are you? Good. How are you? It's great to see you. I'm putting you on gallery. There you go. I don't know if that changed your view. It changed mine a little. Nope. So it's a sunny day in Chicago, so you can't complain, right? Oh my gosh. It, well, aren't the days like this a little bit tricky because um, it looks so nice out and then you step mm -hmm. out and you're like, oh my gosh. That's what I think is good about Chicago is it tricks you about going outside in the winter. And then oh, once you've maybe. gone through all the process to get out there, you just stick it out, you know? That's so, true. Because yeah. yeah, it definitely looks nice, but it is cold out there. It is, it's cold, it's cold. Oh my gosh. Well, we're so excited to have you today. I was going through some of the questions that we asked you. And do you know that Pong was my first video game? <laughs> so what year would that have been? Not to age us, but. Um, it would have been in the seventies, but I don't know. I was born in 65. So it was in the seventies, but I don't know what year, but my parents got, I had, um, you know, six siblings. So our parents got us an Atari and and we had Pong and we played it on the old TV in the basement. So same. Yeah. Same. Was Pong the first game that Ari uh, Atari produced? I think so. I think I so think too. So. Yeah. So and then the next advancement that came along included breakout and yes. um, breakout was in color. And it right. had really good sound effects. So that was right. the game I really liked as a, as a little kid. So yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. And then how far I wonder are we then, when was Donkey Kong? Cause that's when I was like, this is starting to get cool. Cool. I, I know that it existed that. as an arcade game when I was in college, but I don't know when it was a home game, you know, so. Yeah. Because there was like the whole Pac-Man was before that mm -hmm. and Centipede. Yes. Um, so yeah, Donkey Kong was, you know, pretty far up from the very beginning. I feel like it went from Dong, or I'm sorry, from Pong to Donkey Kong. And then, yeah, we're, we're totally going retro. Yeah. Still to this day, my favorite is Miss Pac-Man. Really? Yeah, for so many reasons. Yeah. It is yeah. a fun game, definitely. It so. is. Well, thank you. Um, I, I got a chance to read over your materials, and it, you know, it's it's not something that people like to talk about all the time or think about, but they sure are glad they have it when they do and they need it. Yes, so, definitely. <laughs> you know, I I was overjoyed when you joined the association. And to provide, you know, such great insurance for our members and our member companies. How's it going? How's it been going since you're, I think you've been around for about a year now? Um, we've been in the association for a year, yes. Yeah, sorry, so yeah. it's it's been great in terms of the number of people that we've met and the amount of enthusiasm in the organization. So I'm, you know, pretty excited about the future from that standpoint that um, everyone seems to have a positive view of the future of the industry and everyone is looking to, you know, invite more people in, make it a more diverse industry. And so that's, that's really positive. Um, and, you know, when you're, even though it's been around for a long time, it's still new relative to, you know, traditional sports. So when something's relatively new, hopefully you have the chance to do some things right the first time. So hopefully, you know, this industry can do some things that mainstream sports are struggling with, this industry right. can hopefully do right the first time, so. Yeah, um, I know there, there's just so many things I wanted to talk to you about today. One of them was virtual insurance and it didn't dawn on me how important it was until GoDaddy went down during one of our conferences. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just thought to myself, I'm never going without insurance again because it was a, a, an, a national outage. Just yeah. Of yeah, so, um, you know, people, when you're thinking about 
you know, real world events. There's event cancellation insurance, and that can be for things from covering for the weather. If there's a snowstorm or a hurricane, you know, during the time of your event, people can't get there to participate. Or you can get um, non-appearance coverage if your celebrity guest can't show up, you know, those types of things. And people don't think about that same stuff in the virtual world. But just as I mentioned, non-appearance coverage, if someone is sick, they can't necessarily participate in a virtual event either. And so you still need to think about that, about, you know, being insured for, you know, your key speakers or, or key competitors, whatever it may be, if they're able to attend or not. But in the virtual world, you also take on a lot of new risks um, in, you know, in sort of the cyber um, liability space. Um, for example, a denial of service attack where somebody knows you have this big event coming up and they actually hack into your network and say, oh, guess what? You know, we're not going to let you do this event unless you pay us 100,000 Bitcoin. Um, you know, so that's that's an area that can be covered with insurance. And then there's just the more, um, you know, non um, predatory things that could happen like your ISP, you know, being down for some reason, or your cloud service provider being down, you know, even Google and um, Amazon have outages periodically on, on their cloud services. So um, in the virtual world, you have not only the physical things about people being physically able to participate, and then you also have the virtual things of networks being down or you know, an attack by some hacker group trying to uh, get money out of you, or just someone you know, for the fun of it, you know, wants bragging rights that they blocked an event from happening. You know, they prevented something from happening and gives them bragging rights and, you know, in the hacker world. So yeah, those are things that um, insurance can help deal with and for virtual events. You make so many great points about reasons for insurance. And I'm so excited to have you helping us out with our insurance for our event, being that it's virtual, our second annual virtual event, March 22nd and 23rd. Um, thank you for that. And it's wonderful to partner with you. You have um, made so much movement in our industry in such a short time. I know you've been around a long time, but um, in just a year, it's a lot of, you know, it's just great to work with you. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, we've been around for um, it'll be 13 years in 2021, and we've been um, focusing on esports for it'll be three years in 2021. So, um, in this industry, I guess that makes us, you know, relatively mature. Um, as but yeah. old as Pong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm as old as Pong, but my business is not. Me as too. Old as Pong. <laughs> so, um, but uh, anyway, yeah, for the esports next conference. Um, you know, we're talking about the same kinds of things that um, really any sort of virtual event needs to consider, but event, uh, the general umbrella is event cancellation insurance. So it provides some funds to you if for some reason the event has to be canceled. And the reason you may want those funds is because you may have to refund tickets, for example, um, you know, if people want their money back. Or, you know, if you're going to reschedule the event, you're going to have some duplicate costs you know, from rescheduling, just even just the promotions that you've done for the event, you have to redo again for your new date. So there's, you know, a need for money, either if you're just completely canceling the event or if you're gonna reschedule the event. Um, and the types of things that you can be covered for, um, again, are, um, you know, hacking. So either a denial of service attack or um, some attack that shuts down a vendor that you're relying on, your internet service provider, your cloud service provider, um, any, any vendor like that. Um, it could be any you know, third party that you're using to provide graphics or, or video or whatever during the event. If they are um, shut down, um, you may have to either cancel or postpone your event. Um, and then you might also want non-appearance coverage if you have a keynote speaker or uh, you know, a number of keynote speakers that are really important to the event that if for some reason they weren't able to participate that day, um, that you could you know, 
have the funds to either again to delay or if you had to cancel the event. So um, it just gives you a lot of flexibility and protection that if something goes wrong in the event, you have the funds that you need to do whatever it is that you need to do to resolve it. You know, giving refunds to to ticket holders, rescheduling the event, um, or maybe giving people free tickets to another event that will include the guest speaker who couldn't be at this event. So it just gives you flexibility to, um, to take care of your, um, your clients and, and make um, amends to them over whatever went wrong with your event. Right, right. I am, um, you know, being in sports for over 10 years in sports and events, we have had our share of um, athletes that haven't been able to make it for some reason or not. Mm -hmm. um, usually it was around the events that were in Vegas. <laughs> Incidentally, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Athletes in Vegas? Las Vegas, something yeah. happened. Um, yeah. Well, th that brings me to a thought. Um, what, what would you recommend when you have, you know, a, net, a, a high net worth speaker, individual, athlete, whatnot? Um, when you when you call that key person insurance, yeah. So yeah, if you have a person that's critical to your event, right? Um, there's non-appearance coverage that you would want to have that gives you money if that person does not appear, does not fulfill their role in the event. Um, and again, it allows you the flexibility to reschedule if you need to, to refund tickets if you need to. And even in the virtual world, there's things people don't think of, but if somebody happens to be located in a place that has hurricanes, you know, a hurricane could knock out their, um, their connection so they can't participate in the event. Or if there's somewhere, they live somewhere where there's a blizzard. So even the event's virtual, there are things that can happen that prevents you know, someone from participating. And then there's, it also just covers for things that could impact, you know, a non-virtual event. You know, the person is sick or, you know, they could have, you know, someone in their family in the hospital, you know, goes in the hospital the night before the event. Um, you know, they can't leave their child, their parent, their spouse, whatever, alone at the hospital. And so they're just unable to participate in the event. So there's, you know, things that life happens and um, you want to be protected so that your organization can recover from, you know, something like that happening. So you can, you can make your constituents whole so that they don't feel cheated over the, over whatever happened that, that either canceled or delayed this event. So, um, you know, that the organization can go on and host another event and, and, and keep operating as opposed to, you know, um, potentially even the organization failing because its reputation is so damaged from a failed event that they couldn't, you know, refund tickets or reschedule or whatever they needed to do, so. So what types of different insurance is needed in the esports ecosystem? Um, so, you know, sort of the generic answer is that every business needs insurance because, um, if you have income, you need to protect that income from things going wrong. But there's certainly specialized products that fit um, different different um, types of businesses within the ecosystem. And so one, an easy one to think about that's, that's unique is for publishers. If you think about, um, they can be sued over the content of the game. And an easy example is um, Fortnite was sued over they named a uh, location in the game Coral Castle. And there was a real world Coral Castle in Florida that sued them saying, you know, you were getting, you were infringing on our trademark and you were damaging our brand. Um, so there's a type of insurance called the errors and emissions insurance, commonly called E and O for errors and emissions that covers exactly that. It's, it covers content. Um, you can think about filmmakers buying it and, and authors buying it. And it's the same way for game publishers. They need to, um, you know, protect the content of their games. Another place where it comes up in, in game publishing is actually um, using uh, athletes' likenesses. And so it gets really detailed. So there's an athlete that has a tattoo. Um, clearly, the, you can take pictures of that athlete with the tattoo because it's part of their body, but can you reproduce it in a game or does the tattoo artist actually have a copyright on that? 
there have been lawsuits over the use of tattoos in in video games. That would be another area where errors in emission insurance could protect the uh, the publisher. So that's just a you know a real specific example. But if you think about individual competitors, you know they have gear that they need to protect, you know, expensive equipment that they use that can be insured. Um, they also, as they become successful and have um, a substantial income, they want to protect that income stream. So they could become disabled and not be able to work. Um, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be an injury related to competing in esports. You could fall down the stairs at home and break an arm and you can't compete for a period of time. You can buy um, disability income protection that helps replace your income for that period of time while you're unable to work. Um, you can also think about for an individual player, they may, may, may need to buy their own health insurance uh, because you know, they don't have a, a traditional employer necessarily providing that for them. So um, they may need um, you know, to buy their own health insurance. They might, might want life insurance to protect you know, if they have people dependent on them, you know, spouses, children, whatever, that if they were to pass away, need some, in, need some money to, to carry on the lifestyle they're accustomed to. Um, and they may also want um, errors and omission insurance, e and insurance, if they're streaming. You know, individual streamers can be sued for using music or for having you know, corporate brands in the background without permission, that kind of thing. So you know, when, uh, if streaming becomes a big part of your income, you're producing content. And so you may wanna have insurance to protect that content as well. Um, teams you know, may wanna offer um, benefits to their, um, to their employees. You know, they may wanna offer group health insurance or group life insurance as a way to help recruit um, you know, the best competitors in the business. That's what, you know, big corporations offer benefit packages to recruit the best, you know, the best talent. Well, teams can also, teams, orgs can do that to, you know, as something to help recruit. So there's kind of like at every level in the, in the system, there are pr insurance products designed to, to protect what's important to your business, what's, what's important to your source of income. Which I find you know, so helpful that Johnson asked, um, I'll, I'll never forget when you called the very first time and, and you said, I literally specialize in esports insurance. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's so great to have that need, that niche um, and to be able to speak to and be there for our community. Well, I've, I know I've given this shout out quite a few times, but I have to give credit to Roosevelt University It'll be three years ago in October, I think, a group of Roosevelt University students did a project for me, and it was a business marketing project. And um, my agency has always been focused on um, entertainment and sports insurance, and they were you know, supposed to be giving us ideas of how to grow the business. And they really said, oh, you have to be in esports. It's the future. You know, and, and um, these kids weren't on the esports team at Roosevelt University, but of course they knew about it. And you know, Roosevelt was one of the early adopters of esports at the college level. So they really, um, you know, were the impetus that that got me focusing on this. But um, when you really look at it, I mean, esports is the merger of entertainment and sports, and so it fits perfectly with you know what we've always done. And 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 if you look in the greater world entertainment and sports are merging anyway. You know, athletes are, are you know, celebrities in their own right and they're doing their own, um, you know, fashion brands and podcasts and, you know, uh, broadcasting and all these things. So it's, it's all kind of meshing together. And um, so I feel like we have a lot of background in this industry, even though we've been focusing specifically on esports for about um, three years now. Yeah, that's so interesting. What makes a great insurance agent? Um, I think, well, I'll say two things. One thing is, is sort of more philosophical. I think you have to be interested in what your client does. And that's mm -hmm. why, you know, I started my agency specifically um, because I was, I was actually working in my prior career in the auto industry and um, I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to work with people that I thought were really interesting. And I like, I like creative entrepreneurial people. And I was like, okay, what can I do where I can work with them? And I'm a financial analyst by training. So I'm like, I'm this business guy. 
you know, what, what can I do to bring value to these type of people and use my skill set? And I came upon insurance. Um, and so I only work with people in industries that I find exciting and fun. And I want to learn more about what you do and, and, and that type of thing. And I, and I think that's really important because the better the agent understands what you do, the better they can tailor the insurance package to your needs. Um, and there's just so many businesses in the world that I don't pretend to be able to understand everything. You know, so if a construction company comes to me and asks for insurance, I will say, no, um, I'm not an expert in your field. You need to work with somebody who knows construction and I don't, you know, that type of thing. Um, so I think that is um, a part of it is just being passionate about what the person does. So you know it and you want to always learn more about it and be more directly involved in it. And two, there's really two different kinds of agents. There are company agents and independent agents and company agents work for an insurance company and sell insurance just for that one company. And then I'm an independent agent. So independent agents can sell um, insurance for multiple different insurance companies. And so I think if you're in sort of a non typical business, like I always use dry cleaners as an example, you know, if you're a dry cleaners, there's a million dry cleaners, any insurance company, you know, mainstream insurance company can probably sell you insurance. When you're in something more specialized like esports or entertainment, um, you need someone uh, who can, can put pieces together from different insurance companies to create the um, package that, that you need. So you may not be able to go to one insurance company and they won't have all the products you need. So we can put together a package of, you know, your Airs and emission insurance is from this company and your general liability insurance is from this company and your gear equipment is from this company. And those three things put together make the perfect package for you. Um, and I guess I'd say there's a third thing that you want an agent who's interested in long-term relationships. Um, you know, we've had a lot of our clients since the beginning and it's just the way we like to work that we work with people really personally and we stay um, with them for a long time. So, we never try to oversell anyone on insurance because we're looking at the big picture. It's not about selling them a little bit more this year. It's about them being with us for 10, 15 years as their business grows. And so we always try to, you know, right size the insurance package. And even with some of our clients we work with where they'll have a third party giving them insurance requirements saying, okay, if you wanna work with us, you have to have this much insurance. And we'll work with our clients say, okay, here's a couple things that we think you should go back and try to negotiate lower limits because those limits are too high for your business. So we try to be advisors even to our clients to help them save insurance costs so that in the long run, um, you know, they stick with us. And um, like I, I guess lecture with film students on insurance, um, you know, when they're learning to be film producers. And uh, one of the things I always tell them is that you know, I want to work with you forever and I only need one of you to be Christopher Nolan for me to, you know, have a, have a great, have a great career. So, you know, I'm, we work with people very small because we want to grow with them as they grow and we want to have the right size insurance for them as their business grows throughout, you know, all the phases of the business life. Yeah, I really enjoyed the three takeaways um, that you describe and the vast knowledge and experience you have and the passion first. Obviously, that's it, it's clear that you're passionate and authentic. Um, and then I didn't understand the importance of an independent agent and that you have that pool of all these different um, policies and companies to find the right policy to go back and help negotiate and put together. I always wondered why I would receive so many different plans from one agent. And that makes so much sense now. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, lastly, is just having a long-term relationship. Um, so important and so appreciated <laughs> in, in, in our industry, for sure, which is why, you know, we're happy to have you host uh, Why Insurance Matters um, April 20th from 11 a.m. to 12 Central. And we'll, we'll take a deeper dive and have it be interactive and um we're, we really look forward to, to that webinar. So when should someone or a company, individual, event, operator, when should we call you? 
Um, there's a number of different times. I would say the first thing is that sooner is always better than later. The more time we have to work with you, the better um, options we could potentially develop for you. But it's really, um, if you're farming a new business, um, it's a good time to, to look for an insurance agent. Um, if your business is rapidly growing or changing, you may wanna to talk to some, an insurance agent to really review things and make sure that you have adequate insurance. Um, sometimes when you uh, sign a new contract, you know there'll be insurance requirements in that contract and you can just share those with your insurance agent and they can review it and say, yes, you meet those requirements. No, you don't. Here's what you need to change or, or here's what you should try to negotiate, that type of thing. Um, so that's, that's really, you can think of it mainly as anytime there's a change. Um, and if you look at it on a personal life, you know, those changes are a lot easier to define. If you get married, if you have children, if you get divorced, if you retire, you know, just those big changes in life and your personal insurance are the times that you want to be talking to your insurance agent. And the same thing in your business, when big things are changing in your business, you're growing, you're buying something, you're selling something, you're hiring more people, you're opening another office. When there's big changes um, in your business, you want to be reaching out to your agent and saying, oh, look, this is happening. Is there anything we need to do from an insurance standpoint on this? Um, and we always appreciate when our clients reach out to us on those touch points, because then we can be proactive for them and um, you know, take care of things as opposed to um, trying to clean up messes after the fact. So yeah, just think about anytime there's a big change with your with your business or your work, uh, you want to be just reaching out to your agent, letting them know what's happening, and seeing if they have any advice for you on things you you know you should do or change with your um, with your insurance package. So very interesting, and I know you've been doing this a long time, and I know you're really committed to the long term relationship. How has the, our new environment? of Zoom, um, how has it changed your insurance company? So the, the one thing it's made me realize is that it, we're, I guess, lucky being in insurance that our job is pretty easy to do in a virtual world, you know, that we can operate virtually pretty easily where it's much more difficult for a lot of our clients. Like say, you know, I mentioned we're in the entertainment space, so, you can't have theater productions right now. You can't have music events. You know, in esports, you can't have live events. So I've, I guess I feel lucky that our life has really been easier than what the adjustment was for a lot of people in other industries. Um, but it's also made me also realize the importance of insurance in the virtual world. Like in the past, most people participated in both the real world and the virtual world. Right. And so their virtual things were kind of covered as a part of the package that was covering the whole business. But now there's so many more businesses that really exist only in a virtual world. And we've had to think a lot more about developing insurance packages specifically for those people that, that really only, only exist virtually. Um, and so that's been a, been a, a, you know, a good learning experience uh, out of all of this. So, yeah, I think those are the two big things. That's great. I know you're really committed to learning. And I, I always uh, know when I call you or I see you calling me that it's going to be a very interesting conversation. I would imagine that you're part of uh, uh, communities to um, stay up to date on mm -hmm. all the offerings. I, I think it's just going to be outstanding to go in deep on the different topics that you've been studying. I have such an appreciation to your commitment to lifelong learning. And I, I just know that about you. And I love that about you. You're yeah. very interesting. I definitely love to learn. I'm always, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd at heart. So I'm always like, I'm the guy that if somebody says something in a group that we don't know, I'm immediately looking it up, you know? <laughs> right. So yeah, I just, yeah, I like, I like knowledge. So yeah, I'm always trying to learn more. And yeah. I've often thought when I, if I do retire someday, I, I might just get a PhD just for the fun of it. So sure. <laughs> what would you get your PhD in? I don't know. Something, you know, maybe like art history or um, architectural criticism or something like that. Yeah. Mm. So, well, not something necessarily practical because it's just for, you know, it's about knowledge. It's not about at that point going out and getting a job in the field. So for sure. 
Yeah. I can really tell that, you know, your day isn't about um, making money. I, I could see that. It's really about making connections and helping people. Yeah, I would say that anyone who starts a small business, sure, everybody has hopes of it becoming a huge thing, but but taking a job with a big corporation is is certainly a more guaranteed way to make money. So if, if you're going to start your own business, you should have some passion about it and, and take some joy from doing it because that helps offset sort of the lack of security of a big corporation job and, you know, the guaranteed income and things. So yeah, you definitely need some passion. And like I say, um, that's why I pick the type of clients that I do so that I can be passionate and excited about what they do so that then it's, it's, you know, a joy to work with them and, and see them succeed. So, well. I just have one more question because I've always been wondering this and I had, I've been meaning to ask you. So I, I know originally, I think it was Robert Morris University, which is now Roosevelt, right? Yes. So how did you get there? Why Robert Morris at that time? Why esports? You know, what, what, what was that first connection? Yeah, thank you for correcting me there. So yeah, they were Robert Morris at the time and Robert Morris was the leader in, in um, collegiate esports and then they merged with Roosevelt University. So thanks for correcting me on that. And I actually can't, I can't claim credit for it. It was, um, uh, we were part of a business incubator um, called 2112 in Chicago and um, representatives from Robert Morris came in and they said, oh, we're looking for businesses that our students could do a project for, um, that they could do a marketing project and it would count for school credit for them. And, and you know, you essentially get free advice from this group of students. And so I signed up for it. And um, so you're supposed to give them a task. And I, so I said, oh, I'll give, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for new markets I should try. So I gave them the task of identifying um, a new market for us to enter. And they, and they came up with esports. And uh, so... I have to give them all the credit because it wasn't me, um, but I, I was smart enough to listen to them, I guess. So, um, but yeah, yeah, it was just a, a program that was offered and I put my hand up and said, yes, I'll do it. And, and it was fun working with the students. Um, and I always try to work with students because, um, you know, it sort of keeps you connected with youthful energy and I find that really motivating when I'm working with younger people who are really, you know, excited and have a lot of energy about what they're doing. It also, you know, that rubs off on me. So I like working with students. So I, I guess lecture when I can on insurance. And, and so, yeah, I've had different um, student groups do projects for us. And, you know, we have, not during the pandemic, we haven't, but we normally have interns working with us. So, yeah. So again, I, I give Robert Morris a shout out whenever I can because, um, you know, they steered me, those students steered me in the right direction, so. Well, we sure are glad that they did. And, you know, it does, it takes a village. It's also just so great being your neighbor and sharing, you know, this geographic location with you and this great city. It will be so yeah. nice. To Go ahead. Uh, no, I just think, yeah, I'm really passionate about Chicago. I love Chicago. Me so, too. It'll yeah. be so nice to have um, another member meet up and get together in person safely um, when the time is right. Yeah, I said, that. and that's one of the things that's fun about esports is that it's it's truly international, but it's local at the same time. It's like you know we can have meetings with people around the world and be you know completely engaged. And then the next day you can actually be in a physical space with people near you doing something. And so I like that, that it's, you know, local and global both. So you get both perspectives, so. There's so much um, integrity, whether you're local or international. Um, so much openness uh, in this, it's probably been, I think I've been in um, 21 industries publishing um, associations, societies, and foundations. And this has been the most welcoming, um, authentic community I've ever represented. It's just oh, an terrific. to be part yeah. of it. I, I don't think there's ever a phone call 
This is what I always say. I'm, there's not anyone I ever talk to that says, how can I help you? And, you know, it's just such a part of our everyday conversation. Um, so much collaboration, cooperation in what people may think is a competitive space. Mm -hmm. Just such a complimentary competitor. Um, it's a great group. Yeah, way back when I was in the auto industry, I don't know, maybe in the 90s, there was a big buzz term that was the new thing of coopetition. It was that you cooperate with companies in some someone with, in some realm and you compete with them in another realm and that's perfectly acceptable that somebody can be your collaborator and your competitor at the same time. And I think esports is definitely that where, um, you know, it's very collaborative, but it's also very competitive. I mean, it's based on competition is the whole concept of the industry. So, yeah. So even though that buzzword has kind of died, you, know, you don't really hear people say coopetition anymore, but the concept it. still exists. So, and I think it fits here really well. I love the way you look at things and um, you make it easy to, to talk to my insurance um, broker or consultant because you're so interesting. Um, I guess I, I'm gonna ask you, one final question in the big picture, where, how do you see insurance and why? Yeah, that's a, um, interesting. And sort of when you study insurance, you actually, the concept of insurance is, they call it making someone whole. So when something bad happens, it's about getting you back to where you were before this bad thing happened. So like it never happened. And it's, they say it's always simpler to think sort of in the personal world. So, you know, your house burns down. Um, obviously that's a trauma that you go through that can't be erased, but insurance helps pay to rebuild the house so that you're back to where you were before. You're living in the same house that, that you had before. You're not destitute on the street because your house burned down. And that's sort of the philosophy of it to, to make you whole when bad things happen. So in the business world, it's the same thing, you know, in, in the business world, your office can burn down and it's about rebuilding your office so that you can get back to work. Um, but you know, it's when un, unexpected, unpredictable things happen, allowing you to get back to where you were before so that can, things can continue. So you suffer a major hack that you know, wipes out your, your computer systems for a week. You know, how do you ever recover from that? Well, insurance is part of, of making you whole to get you back to where you were um, so you can continue running your business. So it's, it's um, the philosophy is as much as possible to undo the damage of a bad thing um, and to help, you know, either the individual or the business get back on their feet and keep going. Um, and so that's one of the big things I like about it is that, you know, it, it does when bad things happen, it's there to help people. Can't fix everything, but it can help, you know, pay for things that it need to be repaired, replaced, you know, the, that type of thing. So I think of it as a net positive. That is just outstanding. What an incredible philosophy. Um, keeping you whole, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful philosophy. And we really appreciate your membership and everything you do for our community. And for more questions, we can reach you directly through johnsonese.com. Yep, and my email was just chris at johnsonese.com. So pretty simple. Right I'm on. happy to answer insurance questions. Thank you again for being on our show and a proud member of the Esports Trade Association. My pleasure, thank you very much.